was created in God's image, original Adam, and then what he looked like after he uh, disobeyed and sinned, right? And then what redeemed man looks like, which is a picture of us. Now we begin lesson four um, with angels. And I'll be honest with you, as I have taught this um, particular curriculum for over 12 years now, this has kind of gotten extended, this lesson. And as I was preparing for it this week, and I knew that I was starting just a little bit late, um, or excuse me, a little bit earlier because I'm going to leave earlier, and I was like, okay, ah, i got to get through it. And there's so many verses in this that I'll just send them home and tell them to look it up. And the Holy Spirit said, no, nope, don't do that. We're going to slow down on this lesson. So this lesson will probably take two weeks. The other thing, too, is that I know that there are some newbies to the Word of God here. And I want you to learn your Bible. So we're all going to be going in our Bible and looking at a lot of Scripture. We're going to be patient. And we're just it might take a while to get to the different books since you don't know. Those of you who know your books who are sitting around others that are new, if you could help them, you know, uh, navigate and find the roadmaps in the Bible, that would be great. But I just really feel like the Holy Spirit, it's very important. It's not just about hearing the Word, it's about reading the Word. And that something very, very supernatural happens. And so that is what, again, is, is the Lord is in the process of doing. Supernatural and natural, Coming together was never meant to be separated. Good and evil was never meant to come together. God is in the process of reversing those two things. And so we're going to let him do that. So I definitely will take two weeks on this lesson, okay? Um, so having said that, Ginger, before we pray and go before the Lord, is there anything that you uh, need to add or whatever? We're still on for next week. All yep. is good, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Any other comments from you guys? Any, you know... Anything anybody needs to say? Whatever? Okay, no. All right, that's good. I'm going to use this chair for my Bible because we are going to use the Bible a lot. Okay, good. Then let us go to the throne of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We get to, amazing, isn't it? Think about it. Men of power, and yet we can go to the very throne of God through prayer. Oh, Lord, we just come before you. We thank you. Lord, I thank you for the miracles that you are doing. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for redeeming our lives, Lord. I thank you for the miracles, Father, of relationships that are being put back together. Lord, it's indeed what you have confirmed, even this week, the very thing that I have taught, that you start putting things back in order. And we thank you for it. Lord, I thank you for the people in this room and for bringing them here. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can come and we can eat your word, that we can feed upon your word, Lord, for those are the lasting words. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this room right now. Would you come and would you please teach, Holy Spirit? And would you change us? And would you mold us? And would you continue to sanctify us and make us into one who looks like your son, Jesus? We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, good. Now, angels. There's enough information about angels in the Bible um, to prepare you for the day when you will be surrounded by the good ones in heaven or the bad ones in hell. So no matter where you end up going, you're going to be surrounded by angels. But let's start by talking about the good angels. We're going to cover it all, all right? Angels are commonly associated in our society with Christmas and the birth scene the narratives that are in the gospel, okay? And it's true, angels are an integral part of that record. But many people often put the idea of angels away when they're putting their Christmas decorations away. And it kind of gets put away and out of our thinking for another 12 months. But if you're a science fiction person, science fiction loves to play around the, with the idea of intelligent life somewhere out there in the universe. But the Bible, thousands of years ago, told us that there are myriads of intelligent beings out there. Just myriads of them. The universe, in fact, is not empty, even though we are tied by gravity to this earth. From the very first book of the Bible to the last one, from Genesis to Revelation, you will discover that angels are a part of what happened and what is happening and what will happen. In fact, I will go as far to say that I doubt anyone can really claim to be a full-on Christ follower who doesn't believe in angels. 
because one who is a believer and follower of Jesus Christ must believe in angels because he believed in angels, okay? So before we study the who, the what, and the when of angels and so forth, what we are going to first do is we've got to clear away the wrong idea about angels. Then we will look at what is right, okay? All right, number one, their appearance, okay? We get the idea from our society that they're creatures with long white nighties, uh, nightgowns on, and beautiful <laughs> fair curly hair, and blue eyes, and fairy dolls, woo, and harps, and all of that kind of, and it's a very feminine look in your mind. And maybe they do look like this when we see them in heaven, but you know what the Bible says in Hebrews? It says, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, for some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. And has anyone seen an angel at their doorstep in the way that it's pictured in society? <laughs> I don't think any of us have, okay? Abraham and Lot were visited by angels, and they didn't know it, not realizing that they were dealing with supernatural beings. So angels did come in the simple form of human beings. Some angels can do that. All right, what about their origin? Okay, the origin of angels. Here's a big one that is a wrong idea. They are not people who have died and turned into angels. Yeah, in other words, on the other side of the grave. The Bible gives no grounds for such thinkings. We do not become angels when we die. Every time on Hollywood, you, you know, you're watching a movie, she's an angel, and I'm like, oh! <laughs> it drives me nuts. No, she's not! They got their wings. Right? Oh, yeah, they got their wings. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah no, there's no such thing. You're not going to get wings. Okay, that's what it's not part of your new, new body that you're going to get. Okay, let's talk about their function. Okay? Um, they are not now mediators between God and men, okay? They are not to be worshipped or prayed to, all right? And so that is basically the knots of angels that we kind of do get a little bit from our society. So that brings us to the top of our lesson under good angels, letter A, okay? So let's talk about what they are, all right? Let's start by going to Psalms. Now, one of the ways you can remember to go to Psalms is go to the very center of your Bible for the most part, and you should arrive at Psalms. If you have a study Bible with a whole bunch of study things at the end, it's going to be a little bit more to the left, Psalms. But pretty much you can go to the middle of your Bible and always land in Psalms. So let's go to Psalms 103. <clears throat> Verse 20. Okay, and it says in Psalms 103, verse 20, it says, Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones who carry out his plans, listening for each of his commands. So that gives us some insight as to what angels do, right? Now, let's go over to the New Testament to the right kind of towards the end, and go to Colossians. Okay, it's a small little book, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. You will learn the Bible, and I want you to be working through your Bible and going from different books. It's much better than the phone app. You really should be familiar with your, your actual Bible. And Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, okay, it says this. It says, for through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see, the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities. And notice what it says there, in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. Isn't that amazing? Think about this. Look around. You can see you've got, we've all had the gift of sight in this room. And we can see certain things. We can look at TV and we can look at politics and we see the kingdom of this world, or I should say of this nation, and beyond. But if you will use your spiritual eyes right now, 
the word of God that has all authority says that in the invisible realm, you kind of look up there, there are thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities that are for us in the unseen world. That's pretty incredible. Those are angels, okay? All right, angels are a distinct order of beings between man and God, okay? They were between man and God. They are not eternal. That is a really important concept. A lot of people think that angels are eternal like God, but they had a definite beginning. Go back to the Old Testament, okay? I want you to go back to Job. It's not far from Psalms, okay? And... To the left of Psalms, what is it, Job 38? Oh, Job. Sorry, yeah, Job 38. This is a real big piece of information in the book of Job about angels that we're going to refer to a, a lot in this curriculum. Okay, so let's see, where are we? Job 38, 4 through 7. Okay, and God gave some information to Job. And he is asking Job some questions. And he said, listen, Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundations? And who laid its cornerstone as the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Do you realize what that means? Let's go back to our timeline. And this is what God just told us in the Word. He says, hey, Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? So let's say right here is when God laid the foundations of this earth. And he goes through and he says, as I was doing this and that, and as I was laying the foundations of the earth, what were the angels doing? They were already singing and rejoicing as he was doing it. What does that mean? It means that the angels were created before the foundations of this earth were laid. Mm -hmm. And that's something we need to get solid in our mind and in our thinking about where all of these characters are. So there was God, who is eternal. Uh, God, remember, is uh, someone who doesn't need to be made, right? Mm -hmm. He was just always was. But at one point, angels were created. At another point, he laid the foundations of the earth, and we now know the order. Okay? All right, so that's really important there. Uh, remember, stop me if you have any questions on any of this. So they are not eternal, because eternal, what does eternal mean? No beginning and no ending, but they do have a definite beginning. Um, they were created at some point in time. All right, now let's look at number three. Angels are between man and God, yet, so that means that they are superior to people or to man, yet they are inferior to God. So here's the order of created beings. You have got God, you've got angels, he's not created, right? God is, we know that. So here are the beings. We've got angels, we've got man, and then what? animals that is the order of created beings those are three distinct orders of creatures that god created now what's so incredibly wonderful about that truth right there that truth that i gave you blows the evolution debate totally apart because the evolution argument puts man at the top mm -hmm. Yeah. And man isn't at the top. Angels are at the top. Do you see that? So it just blows that away. Now let's prove that. Let's see that. Let's make sure that that's true in the Bible. Go to the New Testament. Go to the right. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 2. Okay. Hebrews chapter 2. And let's look at verse 6 and 7. 
And actually, what we're going to be reading is what is from the book of Psalms, but I want, to, I want you to see it in, in Hebrews, okay? And it says this in, in Hebrews 2, 6. For in one place the scriptures say, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, or a son of man that you should care for him? Yet you made them only a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. Isn't that something? Right there in the word of God, it confirms that man was created lower than the angels. How much lower? A little lower than the angels. Exactly. Um, let's see, did I, yeah. I want you to get in your mind, too, in terms of the creation. This is really a better, if we're going to really look at that correctly, let's put, let's put God up there. And really, what it looks like is there's a great gulf between God and then what? Angels and then what? Man, Man is a little lower than the angels and then, of course, animals. That's really a better scale, if you would. Let's never bring God down. Let's always keep him up there and understand he, his thoughts are far above our thoughts. His ways are far above our far, not a little far. That's what the words, okay? All right, so that's an important concept right there as well. Okay, good. Let's go on. Um, angels are superior. They are stronger. They are more beautiful. They are more intelligent than man. They belong to heaven. They do not belong to earth. However, even though they belong to heaven, they do not share God's power or his knowledge. Okay? They just don't. That is what you must understand. Let's talk about their strength or their speed, okay? And there is tremendous speed. This is a really cool thing you can do at home this week if you want. There's a story in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel was praying to the Lord in heaven about a need. And you know what? God immediately, immediately heard Daniel's request and his prayers. So you know what God did immediately? He, he dispatched from the very, very, very highest heaven, an angel. He said, go to Daniel's bedroom right now. And you want to know something? That angel was standing there before Daniel, before Daniel finished his prayer. Wow. Now, here's what you could do this week. If you read that prayer out loud with your watch, okay, and just read it at a pretty decent pace, you will discover that that prayer lasts less than one minute. And so God heard that prayer, and in less than one minute, an angel from the very highest of heaven all of a sudden was down in Daniel's room. Now, does that talk to you about some strength and some speed? That's supersonic speed, if there's ever <laughs> supersonic, okay? It also really tells you, listen, you pray. Every single prayer you pray, God is listening. He's hearing you. Isn't that incredibly comforting? So these angels or messengers of heaven, they do fly at supersonic sonic speed to do God's bidding, okay? All right, what else? Let's talk about no, number four, their number. Their uh, number is fixed, okay? There are X amount of angels that God created. When he created the angels, that was X. I don't know the exact number, but what the Bible does tell me is they use the word that there are X equals hosts. Okay? That's, that's the number. Hosts is the number. And hosts in the Hebrew language is the biggest number that they have. That explains in the Hebrew language. We don't know how to explain a bigger number except to say hosts. Let's go back to Psalms. Let's go to um, 148, Psalms 148.2. Okay. And it says uh, in verse 2, it says, Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all the armies of heaven. Or some translation says, all the hosts of heaven. And that's a more accurate translation. So it is all the hosts of heaven. Okay. Now let's talk about something else. Um, 
A lot of people, and this is the biggest, biggest um, misunderstanding of angels, is that most people believe that angels are in the form of female. Okay? Angels are neuter. They are neither male nor female. That's the first thing that you really have to know. They're neuter. There is no marriage of angels. There is no reproduction of angels. He made X amount of angels. That's it. They're neutered. They do not reproduce at all. Okay? However, there are times when they do appear to man as a man, as we read in Hebrews. Be hospitable to everyone, for you don't even know if maybe you are entertaining a stranger. When they do appear... As human, they always <coughs> appear male. Always male when they appear. And when God allows them to appear as a human, okay? They are male. Also, we will find out that even when they don't appear as a human, but they appear as angels, because we're going to find out people were blown away in the Old Testament when they were approached with an angel. So much so it was supernatural that they were seen that they always fell over and fainted. They just like, oh, well, almost always fell over. They, they have male names, and they were very male and in, in masculine in, in their voice and talking. And then they have, like I said, male names, okay? So, they're hosts. There's huge numbers. They are spirits. And thus they have spiritual bodies or heavenly bodies, not fleshly ones. Although they do have power to appear, like I said. Okay, number five. Let's do number five. Where am I in my notes? There are titles, grades, ranks, and names. For instance, in Colossians, you can look it up later, there are archangels and cherubim and seraphim and principalities and powers, okay? We just know that they have different ranks and different orders, okay? For instance, the Bible talks about Michael, the archangel. The Bible also talks about Gabriel, who is an angel. You can read about that in Daniel. There is also a description of the day star or yeah. Lucifer, okay? Now, Lucifer is really more of a description than it is a name, and that is the name of an angel who became a bad angel. That's all part of the story, and we'll get into that, okay? Um, let's see, did I put, yeah, in your notes, you can see there, for instance, Michael the Archangel, he is a warrior angel who appears whenever there is a war or an impending battle concerning Israel, okay? So he's a fighting angel. What about Gabriel? He's God's messenger who carries divine communications, all right? You can read about him in Daniel. Then Lucifer, also known as Daystar, which is a description. He was the anointed guardian cherub. We're going to learn all about that in a couple weeks in Isaiah 14, okay? It's important that you understand they are not omniscient. They are not all-knowing. However, get this, they are learners. You've got to see this. Um, Danny, would you do me a favor and go to Ephesians 3.10? Everybody go to 1 Peter chapter 1. In the past, Danny has been with me and has helped me teach this, and she always was looking up my scriptures for me. That's why I pick on her. Mm -hmm. She knows I'm allowed to do that. <laughs> um, and I want her to read that, but we're going to talk about how they actually learn. Let me know when you get there, 310. Do you have it? Yeah. Can you read it for me? His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, the church here on earth made up of believers is teaching the heavenly realm or the invisible realm the things of God. Yet they're, they know more than us, but yet they're learning from us. Now, that First Peter passage will emphasize what she just said. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, and it says this. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they were prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. Okay? Now, 
Well, let me explain really quick what that means right there. What, what Peter is saying, he's saying all these prophets in the Old Testament were told by God about this great salvation that was being prepared for people. And they just didn't get it. They were like, huh? What? Well, we can understand that because they were just men walking the earth. They were just one of us. Like, we don't really get it. They weren't supposed to get it. But then Peter goes on and he says something else. Verse 12. They were told that their message was not for themselves, but for you here in this room. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. In fact, it is also wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching or looking into these things that happen. They're learners. Mm -hmm. They can't believe this whole salvation process that God is doing. And they're just watching the followers of Christ Jesus on this earth. They're doing his bidding. They're doing what they're told. But they're looking and going, whoa. I can't believe these people are being made into like new creatures. This is incredible. Now, who are we being made into? Jesus. Huh? Jesus. Who? Jesus. Are you sure? Yes. Who are we being made into? God. Just like Jesus, right? Say it with confidence. It's okay. <laughs> who are we being made into? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. Who's Jesus? God. God. And we're made a little bit lower, lower than the angels, and yet we're being made what? That's what the wonder is. They're way more powerful than us. They know way more than us. All sorts of things that they know more. That they're just they're they're more beautiful and everything. And they're looking down at the salvation, going, that that person right there has God inside. I don't even have God inside me. God is inside. Whoa. And they're seeing the transformation that's happening. See, right now, angels look down on man. For believers, one day angels will have to do what with us? With us. They'll have to look up at us. And it's amazing. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. I've seen this class five times now, and I just heard that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that is exactly. So um, let's see. Where are we? Um, that was First Peter. Okay. And that brings us to number seven. <clears throat> believers will judge angels one day. What? Let's go and look at that. 1 Corinthians, we must see that. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 3. And look what Paul is speaking. He's telling a church. Listen, this church that he was talking to in Corinthians, it was in Greece. And they were just acting ridiculous in that church. People were fighting and disputing with each other. They were believers of all things. They weren't in unity. They were, imagine that. <laughs> right? And he says, come on. You've got unity in the spirit. Don't you realize? And let's look at verse 3. He says, don't you realize that one day we will judge angels? So you should surely be able to resolve ordinary disputes in this life. Mm -hmm. See, that's what we're here doing right now. We're being made into the image, back into the image of Jesus, so that one day those angels that have been charged to do God's bidding, we're going to judge them. For their, isn't that heavy? Mm -hmm. Yes, and that is why we've got to take into serious consideration how we deal with life here with each other. Because we are learning how to govern. Is what we are learning how to do. Okay? Okay, good. Now, that covers the good angels and who they are. Before I go on to letter B, uh, yeah, letter B, is there anything, by Trish, um, is there anything, any questions at all? Yes. Um, I have a question. You mentioned that God made angels a fixed amount of number. Uh -huh. And... Um, the other side is also a fixed amount of number. What other side? The demons that came there. Uh, well, there, there were, all were angels that right. were created. Some of those angels became fallen or evil angels, and we'll talk about that. But I want to start with just angels in general. Okay. When God made them, they were all good, and there was X in number. Okay. okay? All right. Good question. Do we all have personal angels? Yes, and we're going to get to that. Okay, because okay. yeah, I've been reading about that. Yes, so yes. I just didn't know where it was in the, in the Bible. The scripture, yes, we but... have we have angels that watch over us and that and that Amen. are 
yes, will deliver us to heaven one day or elsewhere or, you know, um, and, and that, that keep charge of us. Yes. And then is it, do we all, uh, there are also, when you're talking about supernatural strength and, and speed, the stories that we've all heard that, that you know, somehow somebody lifted up a car, right? Or yeah. some, something, a miracle happened and they got the hit head on and, mm -hmm. and they felt something and or there somebody. Maybe an angel there? Yeah. Yes, 100%. In fact, I'm going to give you a couple stories about some angels okay. so that have happened. I, you know, if you are a true believer and you've been walking with, or, and even if you haven't been walking with the Lord for a long time, there's probably, we're going to realize one day when we get to know all and see all, how often that the Lord has dispatched angels to protect us. How many times have you just barely, unknowingly, maybe not been hit by a car on the 405 or the 101? You see what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, so it's incredible. Uh, let's see. Uh, how many years ago was it? Like 15 years ago, something like that. My father was 76, he's 90 now, and he's, he's just living a healthy life. But um, he was 76 years old, and he um, was driving a truck, a big bus, one of those big buses. And he had about 60 Jewish kids that he was returning. It was on July 4th. They had been at camp in Arizona at a special Jewish camp for a week. He was bringing them home on a certain day. And, and, and it was July 4th, he had just dropped off all of those kids. And uh, he was getting ready to go back to bring the bus back to the yard and to gas it up, to park it, and then he was just gonna go home. It was early, early in the morning. He had to get up at like three in the morning to pick the kids up by seven. So it was like, I don't know, 10 or 11 in the morning. So luckily he had dropped off the kids. And he was going, transitioning from one highway to another highway, or like a state highway, to the Big Ten in, in um, Arizona, right downtown Phoenix, right downtown. And, and you know how they do that clover leaf around like that? And there was a guy, apparently my dad in, in a big, big, big bus, you know, it wasn't like a school bus, I'm talking like a, you know, like a Greyhound type of bus or whatever. He got in front of this guy, and you know how it is when you just like, ah, oh, a big truck or a big bus got in front of you and it slows you down, and this guy was a bad dude. He had his four month old baby in the back seat and he was mad and so the, the the bus was going around the corner and the guy got mad and he passed the bus on the cloverleaf and my dad was looking in the side view mirror and when he looked in the side view mirror he saw this man coming up with a car behind him his hands on the steering wheel and a pistol <gasps> just like that shot just like that and dad knew I'm going to be shot he knew it and he came up alongside of the car, and my dad had his hands on the things like that, and he looked, and the guy went just like that, went boom, and it got my dad right here. And he shot over his baby in the back seat to do that. And he realized he didn't kill my dad, and so then he shot my dad right here. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. And what happened is the bullet entered right here, and when a bullet enters the body, it doesn't have a straight trajectory. Right. It, it's like a, um, not a ping pong, ping ball. Ball, like a, a All right. yeah, a pool, pool yeah. ball. Yeah. It kind of just <laughs> dun, 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 dun. And so what it did is the shrapnel and everything that went in there came through the glass first and went here. And the glass saved my dad's life because he was using a hollow point. He was using what FBI used. It's a man killer is what he was using. The only reason my, well, the reason we know that my dad didn't die was because of the Lord, obviously, right? right? Yeah. But anyways, um, it hit him right there, and it, and it um, unhinged the jaw, and my dad's jaw fell. <gasps> and so he was holding his jaw, and he pulled the bus over to the side of the tent, and he got out, and there was blood everywhere. And he, he kind of deliriously went out to the center of the tent to wave people down to help him. And, you know, he just sat down, and it was a long story, and... He was called a miracle man at Good Sam, Good Samaritan Hospital right down in Phoenix. He should not have lived alone just by the blood that he lost, not to mention. They said that the trail of the bullet was the most unbelievable thing. It went around every major vein and artery just like that. Just, wow. dun, 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 just like that. Yeah. Well, we know who that was. And I know that angels were there protecting him. God had dispatched and God knew. God did allow him to be hit. God did allow that. But here's the thing that you can know as a believer, because there's a lot of fear right now in this society with COVID. Mm -hmm. 
I don't care how you feel about COVID, whether you you know it might, it, it, I believe it's, it is an absolute virus, but whether you believe it's a killer, it doesn't matter. Here's the fact. If you're a believer, God will not take you one day sooner Amen. than yes. you are meant yes. to be taken. Amen. Period. Right. Right. And my dad is proof of that. Yeah. He should be dead. You know, God had work for him yet to do. A lot of work. He's 90. <laughs> and he just moved from Phoenix last month and bought a house at 90 years old in Florida. Um, Can you believe that? Because God is not finished with him yet. And that's why I'm telling you, you don't need to fear COVID. Don't. Amen. Don't fear it. Amen. Because if God needs you to be with him, as, as Paul said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. We're out of here. Yes, it's going to be wonderful. <laughs> but if you're here, then guess what? You're going to see the supernatural in your life, and you're going to be used by God. Okay? And that's what you can live with. You have a peace that the rest of the world just doesn't have. So don't get caught up in what they feel. Okay? All right, so anyways. Um, so we will be judging angels one day. So let's get serious about our relationship with the Lord and what is holiness. And let's get sanctified through the power of the Holy Spirit and, and the Word of God, and then be careful with our relationships with others, okay? Okay, ministry to your ministry, angels' ministry, okay? They have a ministry as servants to God and man, okay? They worship God, and they also do His will. Angels basically are the servants of heaven. That's really what they are. The very, very, very rich here on earth can afford to have servants in their home. I'm sure that our Marlago, Trump, has servants in that home of his, as well as a lot of other rich people have servants, right? Um, the Queen in England, they have servants. The uh, White House has servants. That's what angels are. They're heaven's servants, okay? And uh, you know what? Well, let's read these scriptures. Um, we know where Hebrews is. Go to Nehemiah 9 Six, if you would, please. It's before Esther. Before Joe. Esther, Nehemiah, Esther. And what did I say again on that 9-6? Nehemiah, what? 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 Okay, it says this, you alone are the Lord. You made the skies and the heavens and all the stars. You made the earth and the seas and everything in them. You preserved them all, and the angels of heaven worship you. You see that? That's really, really important. Let's go back to Hebrews. Let's look at that too. Hebrews um, chapter 1. Hebrews gives a lot of information about angels. Okay, and I have their um, six and seven. Okay, Hebrews chapter one, verses six and seven. It says, And when he brought his supreme son into the world, God said, Let all of God's angels worship him. Regarding the angels, he says, he sends his angels like the winds, his servants like flames of fire. So now we know not only did he create the angels before he established the earth, but they are his servants. So he created them as heaven's servants, okay? Also look down to verse 13 right there and 14. And God never, never said to any of the angels, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. Therefore, here it is for you, um, Julie, angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. Do you see that? And there's your verse. Okay, and we can, we can know that they are sent. So they do have a ministry, okay, and that's what they do. All right, so first let's talk about their ministry to Jesus, okay? They negotiated, angels did, I'm right on the under letter B. They negotiated with Joseph and Mary concerning his conception. And you can read about that in Matthew and Luke. Um, they helped Jesus when he was tempted in the desert 
with the devil. You can read about that this week if you would like. Twelve plus legions of angels followed Jesus. And you can read about that in Matthew. What is a legion? A legion is 6,000 troops. So 12 plus legions. So you can do the math on that. Okay? Um, how else did they minister to Jesus? They ministered to him when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane. Hard time saying that sometimes. Now, let's talk about it. There was only one crisis. So, so the angels were always watching over Jesus as he walked this earth. But there was one crisis in our Lord's life when the angels didn't come and help. And that was when he was all alone on the cross. There wasn't an angel in sight. The sun had gone out. God had departed. The God of light had gone. And gross darkness came over the earth for three hours. Now, an angel could have pulled the nails out, but didn't. An angel could have blasted those priests and those Jews and the Romans to eternity as easily as we speak. But no angel came. There was no help. The legions that followed him stayed away. But who rolled away the stone at the tomb? No human. It was an angel that rolled the stone away. And that stone was estimated to weigh one and one-fourth tons, which is 2,500 pounds. Can you met one angel? And that angel rolled it, and then he pushed it over, and then he sat on it. <laughs> and when the disciples came looking for Jesus, it was the angels who conveyed the message to them, don't go looking for the living Savior in a cemetery. Isn't that beautiful? And that was their ministry to Jesus, okay? There were also angels when um, Jesus um, ascended back, oops, back to the throne, okay? And you can read about that in Acts. Now, let's talk about ministry to humans, okay? One of the biggest tasks of the angels is to report on what people do with little children. Whoa, and think about all the sex trafficking that's going on. Let's look at Matthew 18.10 really quick to see that. And this is Jesus talking. Okay? And Jesus says this, Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. In other words, every single child has been assigned an angel to watch over and to report what happens to that child. And those angels that are in charge of children have constant access to the throne of God. What was that again? Matthew 18.10. No, what did you say? That, that every single child on this earth has an angel dispatched, watching over them, and they are reporting back to God everything that is happening to that little child. They have access, they have constant access to the very throne of God. So like what at what age is is that angel not with that child? Hebraically thinking and seeing, it would be an age of accountability, which is around 12 or 13, because that's when the Hebrew children were bar mitzvahed. And that's that's about right, because it's around that 12, 13 year age is when uh, a human being starts understanding concepts. Mm -hmm. Before that, we teach them by rote. We teach our children stories of the Bible. We teach them obedience by making them obey. Do you, you know what I'm saying? They don't and are not quite yet ready for concepts. It's around sixth or seventh grade where concepts start really coming in to a human being on average, generally speaking. So, of course, God knows for each and every individual. And so we know generally that's about the age. But the fact of the matter is... Children have a special place. And Jesus' words were, beware what happens. That means every Sunday school room and every Sunday school teacher and nursery worker, it is being reported what is being taught to those children, as well as every public school teacher, as well as what's happening in sex trafficking. Can you imagine how much God has to see 
24, are you hear about it? 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, doesn't that make you say, Jesus, come quickly? Yeah. Yeah. Please just come, just for the sake of the children alone. Mm -hmm. It's time. It's time. So that is a very serious thing, okay? When you think about the cruelty done to the body, the mind, and the soul of little children, oh my goodness, there will be awful retribution because of angels' reports. And they're giving full-on reports exactly as they're called to. And Jesus is saying, what you do is known to angels, and it, it gets reported back to me. Not that God doesn't see it. Of course he sees it. It's like a double testimony because in the Old Testament, it's wherever the witness, um, testimony of two or three witnesses. So you got an angel and you've got the Lord. There's the two right there. Amen. And that's enough Amen. to ex execute judgment right there. They are also watching services of every kind. Angels right now are watching what is being taught in this room, and it's getting reported back to God, and it's either bringing glory to him or it isn't, and it's being recorded, okay? When one person repents of sin and accepts Christ as a Savior, this is just the most beautiful thing, and it's in Luke, okay? Angels in heaven, when one person repents and believes in God, you know what they do? Start singing and praising their heads off. Hosts all around start worshiping when even one human being says, ah, oh my gosh, I'm a sinner. I repent and I believe in you. Woo, and they start praising. Can you imagine? So there's also a lot of praising going on too. Yeah. Okay? Now, what else did they do? Well, they act as a wall of protection. I remember when I was a child, um, I would sometimes, and all children do this, they get scared sometimes at night, right? Yeah. You know, oh my goodness, there's, you know, I heard something, da 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 And I remember, and you need to do this with your children as well, because I see so as, you know, non unbelievers can't do this, but um, for a believing family especially, um, it's, you're teaching the kids a concept without them really understanding a concept, and I think it's a very important thing. It's, you're teaching them faith. When I was a little girl, a couple times I got scared, and my parents came in and said, no, you're not allowed to be scared, and that seems harsh. But you know what they told me? They said, listen, here's what it looks like in our house. Around our house is a wall of angels that are protecting this home. So you're going to trust that because the <coughs> word of God says it. See, that my parents gave me a wonderful gift. Yes. They told me my thinking was wrong. They didn't play into it and say, oh my gosh, well, she just thinks this. You're, no, you're thinking wrong. You're not allowed to think this. Now I want you to turn over, and I want you to put yourself to sleep. You are safe. And that is the beginning of faith, because faith and obedience are linked. And for a child, it's always going to be by way of obedience. And it is that way for us, too. So you're giving your children an incredible 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 gift of faith if you will teach them no you will obey me because then they will be way ahead of the game as they walk along as an adult in the kingdom of god it will be a huge advantage for them okay all right but that is the fact uh when i was nine years old my dad was a salesman and he won a trip for our family to go to south america it was a really big deal way back and it was in aruba and uh, so I have three older brothers, and, and we were there for like, what, seven or eight days, something like that. And we heard that there were really big waves on the other side of the island. We really shouldn't have gone there. All the resorts are on one side of the island where it's very calm. The other side of the island is very dangerous. But we all wanted to swim in these big waves, and oh, my mom did not want my dad to do it. It was, it was a bad decision, really. And so... The waves were absolutely ginormous, and so we didn't go out that far. We probably only went waist deep. We just didn't go that far. The waves are easily 10, 12-foot waves. Yeah. I was little. I was only about eight, plus I was little on top of that, and my, my other two brothers were there with me, so I stayed with my dad. And I mean, all of a sudden, there was a wave that came that was so big, and I was holding on to my dad, and I knew, uh-oh, and I felt it with him. He knew, uh-oh, and he said, baby... He said, whatever you do, he says, you do not let go of me. You hang on. He says, we're going on this, on this wave. And I knew it. So I was little, and I put my, my, you know, I was, I was being held by him, right? So you can imagine I had my legs around him like this, and I did like this. He goes, it's okay. You squeeze me as hard as you can. He goes, whatever you do, don't you dare let go. And I didn't, but the wave was so strong. I kept in that position, and I felt him lift me right up off my father underneath that wave. And I was taken out in the undercurrent and I knew 
And you know, I knew it was real trouble. And I felt a hand on my back. I felt a hand just like this, really strong. And with it, all of a sudden, a great peace. And it just, boom, it just held me down. I couldn't do anything. It just, I just felt the hand right on me. And I felt just such a peace. And all of a sudden, I was dumped on the beach about 50 yards down, and I was knocked out for a while. But there was an angel there that was protecting me. He had plans for me. It wasn't time. Of course, my mom about killed my father. <laughs> that was a bad day <laughs> in their marriage. But I was like, well, I'm fine. <laughs> but I remember as a child, it was just that, that easy for me, you know? Um, my oldest brother, just to give you some angel stories, because I, I think it's important that we declare his glorious acts. Yes. My oldest brother is, uh, he's 10 years older than me, and he married a gal um, who was in a missionary family. She was born in Kenya, and her mom and dad were missionaries. And I'll tell you, it was rough living, you know, not just because they're in Africa, but because of the warring that has always been there. And there were these, you know, these different kinds of raids that would happen in the missionary uh, and they, they would attack. In fact, they would kill families. So she was the oldest of four children. She was a girl, and she had three younger brothers. And she remembers very, very vividly. I think she was probably about 12 or 13 years old. There was a plan that got out that they were going to raid that particular missionary-like compound, and they were going to kill them. That was it. I mean, that it was over. <clears throat> And so her mom and dad, you know, they hit their knees, and they were just, Lord, we are just in your protection and your care. And if this is going to be fatal, then we belong to you, and you can take us. And they had to put the kids to bed that night saying, we, we might wake up with Jesus, but it is his plan. And this is, he is in charge of our life. And that's spirit-filled living, you know. And we're going to pray his will be done. And we're going to pray, you know. And either, either way, we can't, we're out of the devil's reach. We're out of his, his, his touch. And so anyways, they woke up the next morning, and, you know, they were like, wow, thank you, Lord, we were protected, and there was a major work that was going on there. And so her dad was like, what happened? Like, what happened? Did they, did they not raid? And sure enough, the scuttlebutt came back through the raiding parties that they did come. They were big. There was a big fence around the compound, and they had gates, like iron gates, but they weren't that big of gates or whatever. And there were gates, and sure enough, those raiding parties came and approached the gates. And they said they didn't come in because there were two giant figures, two humongous figures that were had flaming swords that, that they couldn't pass. They were angels around that compound. And you talk to missionaries today who are really in the thick of it, and you will hear lots of stories like that. Okay. Yeah. My daughter did YWAM, uh -huh. and she they were in the uh, Papua New Guinea and going to an island, and the boat ran out of gas. Like they're halfway, there was they're on a yeah. little tiny boat, yeah. like a million people on this boat. I don't remember how many, mm -hmm. but a lot of people, way more than it should have been. Mm -hmm. And she said, "Mom, there's no logical reason why we still made it. But they didn't yeah. know they ran out of gas until they got there, but that's they're right. like the guy driving the boat said, there's no way, there's no way for no, could not. And that's where you know." Um, there is a real sad thing, generally speaking, in America, and that is even though we have a fundamental understanding, kind of, or at least our heritage does of the Word of God, and this has to do with church history, and it's a whole other subject for a whole other time, um, we've kind of cut out the supernatural in this country, and uh, it's a problem. And you know, I'll tell you something, the people of this country who have believed strongly in no supernatural, They've gone on to the mission field and they've come back change people. Mm -hmm. And it is. We worship. True worshipers worship how? Speak in spirit, spirit and in truth. truth. Mm -hmm. Again, remember, the supernatural and the natural were never meant to be separated. But they are, that is being reversed. And that is how we are to be, a people. Mm -hmm. And as we get worse, things get worse here in the United States, what will happen is the true believers will have to and only be able to rely upon the Holy Spirit. And when we begin to rely only upon the Holy Spirit is when we will start seeing more of the supernatural. The problem is we've had no needs too much in America, and that's part of the problem. We've relied on the natural instead of the supernatural. In, you know, all of these missionary places that are really rough, and, and even in China right now and what they're doing, they're having to rely on the supernatural. And when you do that, you will see miracles, okay? And so that's the difference. So, yes, they act as walls of protection and so forth, okay? 
Um, so let's see, if you go down to the bottom of page one, so that's their ministry to children. They rejoice at repentance. They act as a wall of protection. Look at Daniel in the lion's den. What else do they do? They carry believers to heaven when they die. Luke 16, you can read about that. They provide, listen, they can cook. Read the account of Elijah in 1 Kings 19. Yeah, they cook, yay. Okay, they punish. They are used as God, uh, God uses them to pour out wrath and punishment on man. The Garden of Eden, they um, were used to uh, kick Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, and two um, uh, angels, you know, were guarding the way back so they couldn't get back in. What about Sodom and Gomorrah? They were used. Um, there was one angel, it's a great story in 2 Kings, uh, a narrative, I should say, not a story, a narrative. One angel who killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers all by himself. In Revelation, you can read about them being responsible for pouring out the wrath of God. What else do they do? Deliverance. Peter in prison, they open the prison doors, or, you know, they can do that. They can guide. They can, the Holy Spirit we have now to guide us, but it doesn't mean that God couldn't use an angel like he did with Philip and Cornelius and so forth. And so the bottom line is that one day we are all going to meet the angels. One day you will believe in the angels, okay? And so that is their ministry. Now, that brings us to the bottom of good angels and what they do. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me just add this. There will be a day, whether you believe in angels or not, when the Lord Jesus is coming back, and everybody alive, the whole entire world will see him, and they will instantly look, and they will know that he is Lord. But I'm also told in the Bible that when he returns, he's going to come with his angels, and people will see angels with him. Again, they're God's messengers. They send, He sends them to help us and serve our needs if we belong to him. Okay? And so that's basically good angels. So let's continue on because we've got time, and let's go on to the bad angels, Roman numeral two, okay? There are three surprises that you get when you read your Bible. Number one, there are other intelligent creatures, which are called angels. And then here's the second surprise. There are bad ones as well as good ones, okay? And number three, they aren't all in some underworld, but they are in the heavenly places, the good, the bad, and the ugly, all right? The real battle today is not only on earth, but it's in the heavenlies, too. That's where battle is going on. So the age-old question is, where did evil come from? Which brings us to the top of our lesson. It didn't originate with God. When he made everything, he looked at everything he made, and what did God say? It is good. Yes. So evil didn't come from him. And it didn't start with man either, believe it or not. The Bible explains that evil started with the angels. Okay? There isn't too much information in the Bible about how evil began among the angels because the Bible is written for the main purpose of facing human beings with their own responsibility of sin. We only need to know insofar as that they can influence your life for evil. But all the evil in the world is not meant to be blamed on the angels. There's way too many Christians walking around who love to blame all their sin on the devil. The devil was never meant to be your comfort. Don't use him as a comfort. He's not. But when we piece all of the information together, we can see two main things about angels. When they were created, they had a free will. And guess what? Some of them sinned and fell from certain positions that they were given. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Now this is about some of the angels, not all of the angels, in this verse that we're going to read. And you might go home a little bit confused. You might have questions, but I promise you, just keep sticking in this class, and we're going to get through it really slowly. We're going to get through everything about it, with all your questions. And it says this, For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell 
in gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment. Okay? Now, that's not all of them, but that's some of them. The bad angels who are free are led by Lucifer. You see, what happened is Lucifer, he was one in particular angel that we're going to study more about. He initiated an insurrection to overthrow God, to take his kingdom from him, to take the very throne away from God. Now, it didn't work, okay? And we're going to study that very soon as we get into the story. But let's just talk about these bad angels. They are still cunning. They are still powerful, and guess what? They are great in number, the bad angels are, okay? They are now referred to as demons, and they are enemies of God and man and are endeavoring to destroy the works of God. That's their purpose. Now, we're in Peter. Go to the left. Let's go to 1 Peter 5, 8 and see what it says there. And it says, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Wow, that's quite a warning, isn't it? Look out, watch out, be on guard. Isn't that crazy? Okay, um, uh, so they are enemies of God and us. Okay, what do they do? They torment they possess, and they lead people away from God and his truth, okay? Now, what are they? Well, they are disembodied spirits, but they have the ability to show themselves visibly. Not always will they, but they can. And they make their power felt by possessing the body of a man or an animal or means of an apparition, which is like a ghostly looking phenomenon or something, okay? Um, now, let's talk about that thing right there. They torment, they possess, and they lead people away from God. The biggest question that I get, because they do possess, oh my gosh, can they possess a believer? No. You can put your mind at ease about that. We now are indwelled by who? That's right. The Holy Spirit, okay? Can they oppress a believer? Yes, they can. And we're going to talk about ways in which we're going to be able to deal with that kind of thing. Because there is a war. We are living in conflict, okay? But notice what I also put there. They can lead people away from God. Now, obviously, it's going to be in partnership. But let's take Judas, for instance, who betrayed Christ. Think about it. Judas was chosen by Jesus. He believed in Jesus. He slept and he ate with Jesus. He preached. He taught. He was given the anointing to heal and to cast out demons, and he ended up in hell. That's a very real picture of a human who was led away. Now, I'm not going to make the devil all the comfort for Judas. Oh, my gosh, if the devil did it to Judas, he could do it to us. Judas had his part in it, and we'll study that as we continue on. But the fact of the matter is there is a type of Judas. It can happen, and we need to know that. And that's why we just read that scripture. Beware. He's on the prowl. you got to be watching out. You can't, you, you're still in it. you got to understand, until we're taken to be with the Lord, we are living in enemy territory. When you're in enemy territory, you got to be on guard. It's just a fact, right? Okay. Um, now, there are two classes of fallen angels. There are some that are bound up, and then there are some that are roaming, all right? Now, let's talk about the bound up ones. We read that in 2 Peter. This will be covered more when we get to the Noahic Covenant. We will talk about those demons, those fallen angels that are bound right now. So we're going to put that off until the Noahic Covenant. But the roaming around ones, those are the ones that are free with Satan to move throughout the earth. Satan is not yet bound up. In fact, uh, God had uh, a roll call at one point in time. He probably does it often. And Satan was late. And he said to Satan, where have you been? You're tardy. And you know what Satan said? He goes, I've been to and fro through all the earth, 
So he has a roaming ability. He's here and there and everywhere, okay? So we know that there are those that roam, okay? All right, now, what is their, if you will, ministry, okay, of bad angels? Here it is. Their goal is to deceive people, believers, and destroy them. That is their goal. They have a purpose. They've got a real bent, okay? And let's go to Ephesians 6, 12. This is a very, very important verse as a believer that you're going to need to know. And this is, again, written to, these words are for believers. These are not for unbelievers. This is a, a letter that was written to a church, okay? And it says this, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Wow. Listen. The aim of every demon is to deceive you until your thinking becomes crooked, until you cannot see the truth. Their goal is to try to get you to twist your thinking and to delude and then to either destroy you physically, mentally, or spiritually. And from that last week's lesson of the house, we know it's all connected anyways, right? Okay, now that is exactly what their goal. So what... What in the world could we possibly do? Because if we are still made a little bit lower than the angels, including the fallen angels, how in the world can we ever, ever have any defense against this? Well, we have that's right. We have authority, and we've got the word of God, right? And we're true worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth, right? Mm -hmm. But now here's there's some things that we've just got to do, and we've got to know. Their job, their ministry, their goal, they are hell-bent on deceiving you. Now remember, see, deceiving is not lying. Remember my Oreo description yes. of my son, right? It would be as if I went into, I don't know, Starbucks this afternoon and said, you know, I need my triple latte, you know, with whole milk, and I gave him Monopoly money. Here, here's some Monopoly money. Here, Nobody would take that money and give me my latte. They're not going to be fooled by that, right? There was a, a great movie that was done with Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio, Catch Me If You Can. Do you remember that movie? Incredible movie. And that was a, based on a true story. And there was this guy who was genius with being able to make counterfeit money. Incredibly genius with it. And he just lived the high life because this guy could make money like no other. And the FBI, for years and years and years and years, were after him. And the guy who played the, the lead FBI guy was Tom Hanks, okay, in that movie. And it almost got to be, it was such a long pursuit of Leonardo that the FBI guy and Leonardo got kind of like a sick kind of friendship, if you will, between good and between evil. Well, long story short, Leonardo was finally captured and he was put into prison by the FBI guy. But eventually, the FBI came back towards the end of Leonardo's sentence that he had fulfilled and said, I have a job opportunity for you. Would you come and would you help the FBI, the department that works on counterfeit monetary things, and help us be able to identify so he gave him a chance to do it? Now, it's a really cool story like this because counterfeit is so close to the real thing. Do you want to know what they did in the FBI before they had computers? They would sit certain guys down who were in the counterfeit division, and they would sit them down and said, oh, you got to learn about being able to identify counterfeit. So what do you think they did? Put a bunch of different counterfeits in front of them? Not at all. What they did is they put these guys in a room, and they put all of the genuine articles of harmonic. They gave them $1 bill, $5 bill, $10 bills, $100 bills, and they said, now you got to learn what the real thing looks like. you got to know the feel of it, the smell of it, the taste of it. You've got to know every little bit of it. And when you know the dollar bill and whatever, you know all these bills this well, you will be able to quickly identify what? Mm, That's exactly how you study. And today, there is a lot of counterfeit out there. And I'm seeing a lot of Christians who are getting caught up in wanting to study the counterfeit. 
They're mm -hmm. going about it the wrong way. There's only one safe way to identify counterfeit, and that is by knowing the real thing. Guess what? Leonardo DiCaprio, the guy he played, long before he started making counterfeit, you know what that genius did? He sat down and he studied the genuine. He knew the genuine so well that he was able to make the counterfeit so well. The devil knows the Bible. The devil knows the word. Your defense is going to be in knowing the word of God. That is how Jesus fought the devil in the desert when he was being tempted. He didn't just cast the devil out. Be gone, devil. You know what he did? He had to interact with the devil. And he said, it is written. And then he spoke what the word was that was written. Jesus knew the word. It's both. You've got to know the word and you've got to have the spirit. You've got to have both. That's going to be the only way. Because let me tell you something. The demonic has got a target on your back. They have a target on the unbeliever's back too. Oh my goodness, that one's easy. If you're an unbeliever, guess what? You're in the dark. All you have to do is keep them in the dark. It's yeah. easy to keep yeah. somebody in the dark. Yeah. That's not really the challenge. We're the challenge. So the minute you get somebody who repents and believes, there's rejoicing going on by the holy angels. Thank you, Jesus, you know, so-and-so. Just, you know, repent, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, the same thing. There's, there's all of a sudden, the fallen angels. Okay, guys, let's have a talk. <laughs> let's get a target put on Sally's back because she's just converted and she believes in Jesus and she belongs to him. We got to take her down. That's, and that's how it goes. That's the... That is the war that's going on in the heavenlies. I don't care where you go today. You go out and you look. It's a beautiful day today. Whether you're going to go out east and see the mountains more or whether you're going to go be the ocean. I want you to start using your spiritual eyes and I want you to look up into the beautiful sky and whether you see the mountains or the ocean and you say, oh Lord, thank you for this creation. It's so beautiful. I want you to, to, to take the curtain back. I want you to take it back and I want you to see the war in the heavenlies that is going on because that is what is happening. That's exactly what's happening in the heavenlies even now. There is war. It's not peaceful up there. There's a war and it's massive. In fact, if we saw it, we would be blown away. It would take, it would, we'd all be on the floor if we saw it. Every one of us would be, okay? All right, so let's see, where am I in my notes? Um, so that is their goal. Um, we must know the word, okay? Now, Satan's mi uh, method is mimicry. It says in 2 Corinthians there that he comes as an angel of light. He's going to come like the counterfeit. He's never going to approach you like monopoly money. Oh my gosh, there's the double. <laughs> it won't be like that. It will be really hard to tell. He will come as an angel of light, okay? All right, Satan's kingdom. It is a kingdom of disobedience. And every single one of us in this yes. room were born into that kingdom. You hold a baby, I don't care how beautiful they are, they've been born into the kingdom of darkness, okay? It is a kingdom of darkness morally as well as mentally, okay? It is a kingdom of disease. God never, ever intended sickness or disease on this earth. Never did he intend to have to have some people become doctors and nurses. That is a mercy of God that we have doctors and nurses and scientists who study diseases, but it was never God's intention to have that. It's a kingdom of death. And death was never intended for human beings. Never, ever. Let's talk about death. Every single time you see a hearse, you see something that Satan did. Because death was never, ever intended for human beings. It's so sad when somebody loses a loved one that was never meant to be. Relationships were never meant to be broken between moms and dads and sisters and brothers and whatever through death. You know, it's Greek thinking that says, well, it's, it's just so good. You know, it's good. It's, well, it's good that they're not suffering anymore, yes. But actually, understand that Hebraically thinking, death is a terrible thing. And death should bring great tears because it was never meant. In fact, every cemetery that you see owes its very existence to Satan. And when you see a cemetery, you should be looking. That is what Satan did. Okay? 
and that is his kingdom because he is the adversary of God's kingdom. All right? Let's go on a little bit more. Let's go to Roman numeral three. Angel worship. Forbidden. Period. End of discussion. And it's a problem in some places. All right? Our worship belongs to who? God alone. That is it. God alone. Let's go to Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9. John, he was the baby. He was an old man when he wrote Revelation. But he was the baby disciple when Jesus chose the disciples. He was the youngest. And he was the closest to Jesus. I think Jesus probably treated him extra special because he was so young. He took extra good care of John. John was the one who, who got to lay on Jesus' breast and got to, to lay next to him and needed a lot of love. And Jesus was very gentle with John. Now he's an old man, okay? John has been a faithful servant. He's the only one of the apostles who was not murdered for his faith. God preserved John so that he could write this, okay? All right, so let's look at 8 and 9. And he says this, I, John... And the one who heard and saw all these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he, the angel, said, no, no, don't worship me. I am a servant of God just like you and your brothers, the prophets, as well as all who obey what is written in this book. Worship only God. Period. So here's what happened. It's not that John was getting away from the Lord or being deceived by a demon. I'm going to tell you right now, if any one of us were to see an angel, not as a man, but as an angel, do you want to know something? Every one of us would be tempted to bow down and worship because it's supernatural. We're not familiar with supernatural. It's not normal to us. It would scare us, and we would just want to, there would be something in us. And that good angel, no, get up, never worship me. You only worship God. Now, in our human form, we know that, okay? And that's exactly what happened to John right there. But it's very, very dangerous because I, oh my gosh, in the 50 years, I've been serving the Lord over 50 years, but I have seen for over 50 years, many, many Christians throughout these decades become angel conscious. And there is potential for heavenly angels even today to lead us astray there's some churches here in america today who are extremely angel conscious stay away from it it's dangerous stuff you don't get near that stuff are the angels worshiping with us when we worship the lord yes thank you lord and i'm glad that they are and i you know what that's wonderful i can know that that's not my focus my focus is jesus and him alone right let's look at what this is a a command to us of galatians 1 8. There's a warning in the Bible, and it's gotta be it's gotta be possible, otherwise it wouldn't be a warning. And it says in Galatians 1 8. Very important word to the church. And it said, Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us, or even an angel from heaven who preaches a different kind of of good news than the one we preach to you. Look at that. Like God's curse fall on anyone, including us or even an angel from heaven, who preaches, not who preach, not past tense, who preaches, it's present. So that word is for us today, okay? Let a curse come down. Listen, everything that I say up here, one of the reasons I'm going to make you go in your Bibles a lot is because I want what I say to be lined up with the Word of God. It is your duty to test my words against the Word of God. And anything that is not lined up with the Word of God, you dump what I say and you go with the Word of God. But apparently, according to that very word that we just read, there's a potential even for the angels. In other words, the angels are still having to be very careful, okay? And that's why it's not healthy to become angel conscious. Don't. They're there. They're there for your protection. We can talk about the miracles, and we can give glory to God when he dispatches an angel on our behalf to do things. We don't thank the angel. We thank who? Jesus. And that's why I know that there was an angel there with my dad the day he got shot or when I was, you know, in the Caribbean and I almost drowned or, 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 or whatever. But we don't go thanking angels. We thank Jesus, okay? So that is very, very, very important. 
Um, all right, I think at this point, let's see, where are we? Rome, Roman numeral three, I gotta get my things on. Conflict of supernatural. You know, I, I wanna save this rest, it's too important. Let's start in Roman numeral four next week. Conflict of supernatural powers. We'll finish out lesson four next week, and um, I've got a lot of drawing that you're going to want to do. We're going to talk about a big portion of the timeline next week. So let's start with, can you remind me I start at four? Yep. Roman numeral four. Let's start there next week, okay, because it's only five minutes and it's crazy for me to get into. It's a good breaking point right now. But you know what, let, let me pray really quick before we go. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. Oh, I'm just so grateful that you, you didn't just redeem us, Lord, but you've just been so careful to just to give us everything that we, your people, need to know, Lord, to teach us and to guide us, Lord. Lord, you show us things that are happening in the unseen world that unbelievers don't even get to see. We are your people, Lord, who you indwell us, and Lord, we get to go around. And Lord, you've given us a certain authority and, and allowed us to use your name. Lord, I pray that as we go forward, that this word would not be robbed or taken away, but rather that it would grow deep, that the soil would be prepared even now, Lord, that it would it would um, uh, germinate and things would grow and the roots would go down deep. Lord, I pray that you would give us spiritual eyes, Lord, to be able to see beyond those disputes and the problems of this world. Lord, whether they're political, whether they're interpersonal relationships, Lord, that we understand that there is a war going on in the invisible realm, Lord, and there's things that are, are, are targeted, Lord, but Lord, that we have become more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray that this word would go deep, Lord, and that we would learn the word and that we would be true worshipers in spirit and in truth. Now, Lord, I ask for a blessing upon each and every person here. Lord, bless their work, bless their sleep, bless their shelter, bless their words, bless their goings and their comings. Lord, as these people go and meet others, may they bring blessings to others. May they be a blessing to others and bring us back safely next week. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. amen.